Praise the Lord today. I get to teach about a subject which is holy to the Lord. As we heard in the Torah reading, and that is about tithes and offerings. And how many of you know that it's not that we have to give, but hallelujah, we get to give. Amen. Praise the Lord. And remember that God loves a cheerful giver. Now, it is, in reality, my responsibility uh, to give this teaching at least once a year about tithes and offerings. Again, it's about holiness, it's about obedience. The Lord says in the, the prophet Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, for they have forgotten the Torah of their God. And many believers today, we know uh, they are suffering financially for lack of knowledge because they have not been taught about the subject of tithes and offerings. And I'm sorry to say this, but there are many pastors, I believe, that are afraid or out of fear to teach on this subject for fear that they may, uh, you know, drive congregants away. But in reality, I see that as being selfish because they're caring more about themselves than the welfare of the people. And so many believers today are suffering financially for that reason, also just because of rebellion. Meaning, I know what it says, but I'm just not going to do it. And some out of fear themselves, meaning lack of faith and not believing that God is going to provide for them. And that leads to rebellion against God's word. Now, I've been to rabbi for about 12 years here in Branson. We have a wonderful congregation, praise the Lord. And I want to see all of you get God's richest blessing upon your life, every area of your life. And really, my heart is to see that you all walk in the blessings of the Almighty God. We all know that there are blessings for obedience to the Word, that there are curses for disobedience, even financial curses, according to the prophet Malachi, chapter 3, verse 9. And you can be sure that Satan wants to attack your finances. And he will use disobedience to God's Word in order to accomplish that. Remember... Yeshua said in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come to give you the abundant life. How many of you want the abundant life in Yeshua? Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It comes with obedience to God's word. Now, in the past or over the years, I've given many teachings on what I would call anointed giving. You know, we have anointed singing and anointed worship and anointed dancing before the Lord. But also, there is anointed giving, giving by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it begins with the tithe. In Hebrew, it's pronounced ma'asar, which means a tenth. And tithing is actually just the starting place of anointed giving. It's just basic. It's fundamental. It's elementary. It's kindergarten stuff. Luke 16, verse 11 Yeshua says, if someone can't be trusted in the little things like money, how can they be trusted with the greater riches? And so I would say today for those of you who are aspiring perhaps to be on the worship team or to teach the Word of God uh, in our Torah studies or in our big Midrash classes or be in other leadership positions, we need to take that scripture to heart. If you can't be trusted in little things, you're not going to be given the greater areas of responsibility. As a matter of fact, every believer needs to take that scripture to heart because we are all a royal priesthood. We're all priests in God's kingdom. So anointed giving begins with the tithe, then anointed giving continues with free will offerings and that are above and beyond the tithe. Paul speaks of this in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, when he says, He who sows sparingly 
will reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Again, this is above and beyond the tithe. Yeshua says in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Given it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. You know, how many of you know that you can't outgive God? Amen. That is a secret of the kingdom. That is a pearl of great price. You cannot outgive God. Now, the third level of anointed giving actually exceeds the first two, and that is giving out of your own poverty. This is difficult, but we know Yeshua commended the woman who put in the widow's might in uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 42, and he actually said she put in more than everybody else by comparison. We know that Miriam, who was the sister of Martha, she anointed Yeshua's feet with a very expensive perfume, probably cost her her life savings, preparing Yeshua for his burial in John chapter 12. And then there is the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings chapter 17, who gave her last bit of flour and oil to the prophet Elijah, and what happened as a result of that? Her son was raised from the dead. Giving out of poverty leads to abundance. So all of these categories really are, are anointed giving. The Bible itself is all about giving. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, Yeshua said, Freely you have received, freely give. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it reads, It is better to give than to receive. And if that's not enough, John 3, 16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only begotten Son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You know, that in itself proves you can't outgive God. And by nature, God is a giver. And let's remember that we are created in his image. We should be givers also. Now, let's look at a good Torah foundation, a scriptural basis for tithing. Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14, let's begin with verse 18. This takes place when Abram is coming back from the battle after rescuing his nephew Lot, really pronounced Lot in Hebrew, although I know people like to say Lot a lot. <laughs> after rescuing his nephew from the pagan kings, verse 18. Then Malkit Sedek, everyone say Malkit Sedek. I don't care what you've heard before in the past, it's not Melchizedek. It's Malki Sedek. One more time. Malki Sedek. King of Salem, underline that, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God, highlight that, most high. And he blessed him, meaning he blessed Abram. And he said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, meaning then Abram, gave him a tithe of all. It reads again, Ma'asar. Now, most of us, I think, know by now that Malkitzedek is clearly a foretype of Yeshua. Again, his name, Malkitzedek, means my king of righteousness. Yeshua is God's king of righteousness. It says that Malkitzedek is the king of Salem, which is an ancient name for Jerusalem. We know that Yeshua is the king of Jerusalem. It also says that he was a high priest, and we know that Yeshua is our great high priest. 
after the order of Malki Tzedek, says Melech David in Psalm 110, verse 4, and repeated again in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, also adds that Malki Tzedek was made like the Son of God. And also, like Malki Tzedek, Yeshua, at the last Seder, he brought out bread and wine, and he gave it to his disciples, his Jewish disciples, who were the seed of Abraham. Many parallels there. The prophet Isaiah says in chapter 51, verse 1 and 2, Listen to me, all you who follow after righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. So our father Abraham, Avinu Abraham, he sets an early example of tithing for all believers. I believe that in his infinite wisdom, God made sure of that so that we could learn from our father Abraham. Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 says, If you are in the Messiah, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the, your promise. So fathers and grandfathers, set a good example for your children, just like our father Abraham did for us. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 28. Let's begin with verse 18. And this is after Jacob's dream of angels ascending and descending from heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone he had put at his head. He set it up as a pillar and poured oil, underline, he poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel or Beit El in Hebrew, verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow. The word vow reads in Hebrew, neder, which means a promise to God. Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give you a tent. It reads aser, a tithe, to you. And so Yaakov, he actually anoints the stone with oil, and he calls that place Betel. Paul, if we could show that PowerPoint once more, we've seen this. But there you can see Betel, and in close proximity, you can see the sacred name of God, Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. God engraved his name in the land there, right next to Bethel, or Bethel, which means house of God. The very first place in the Bible that was anointed with oil is connected with the promise to tithe and to bring it into the house of God. And everything that God did for Jacob, meaning he provided food and clothing and protection for him, he does for us today. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches in the Messiah, Yeshua. And notice also that Jacob made a vow to tithe that he kept it. You know, the Torah says in Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, when a man makes a vow, he must keep it. And so, like Jacob, we need to bring the tithe into God's house today. Now, let's turn to Leviticus chapter 27. And this is from this week's Torah portion, as we heard earlier, the Hu Kotai, which means in my statutes. Leviticus 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, 
is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Verse 32. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. See, this subject really is about holiness. And you know, the Israelites, they knew that the tithe was holy to the Lord. And as a result, they never lacked for anything. And we won't either if we obey God's commandments. Psalm 37, verse 25 says, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging for bread. You know, I've been a believer now for 36 years and I have been tithing since day one. All glory to God. And the Lord has always provided all of the needs of our family. And you know, I've also taught my children the principle of tithing. And God has always provided for them as well. A lot of times through me, but the Lord is always providing for our family. How many of you know what I'm talking about? The Israelites, they never had to borrow, yet they did lend to many nations, says Deuteronomy 28, verse 12. They were the head, not the tail. They were above and not below. As a matter of fact, I don't know how many of you realize this, but the Israelites tithe 23 and one-third percent, not just 10 percent. How many of you knew that? Not too many. Now you know. Let me give you the scriptures for that. 10 percent each year for the priests and for the Levites, according to Numbers 18, verse 21. 10% each year for the temple storehouse. It says Deuteronomy 12, verse 5 and 6, and Malachi 3, verse 10. And then 10% every third year for the Levites, the widows, and the orphans, and the strangers, meaning the Gentiles living amongst them, according to Deuteronomy 14, verse 28 and verse 29. I thought that was interesting. The Israelites, they help to support the Gentiles according to the Torah. And what's also very interesting is that Romans 15 27 tells us that the Gentiles have an obligation, obligation to bless the Jewish people financially. So what does that mean? In the end we all help each other. Now let's turn to the prophet Haggai. And Haggai is between Zephaniah and Zechariah. Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. Let's begin with verse 5. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Adonai Tzavot, consider your ways. God is actually reasoning with his people here. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earn, earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Meaning the Lord is saying, to his people, your priorities are in the wrong place. My ways are higher than your ways. Hear what I'm saying. Verse 8. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Or in other words, God is saying, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other blessings will be added as well. And the building up of God's kingdom should be our first priority. And then in turn, God will take care of you and me and our families. Let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23. We've looked at the spiritual concept, biblical concept of tithing in the Tanakh. Now let's look in the New Covenant. 
Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Yeshua is rebuking the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the Torah, such as justice and mercy and faith. And here's the key part. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Other translations read, you should have practiced the latter, meaning justice, mercy, and faith, without neglecting the former, mean, meaning tithing. Which again is just fundamental. Yeshua repeats these words again in Luke chapter 11, verse 42. Now there are other teachings of Messiah, such as Matthew 6.20, Store up treasures for yourself in heaven, where moth nor rust destroy, nor where thieves can break in and steal. Matthew 6.24, he says you cannot serve both God and money. As I say that, I'm reminded of a nice Jewish guy. His name was Bob Dylan. He says, Oh, it might be the devil. Oh, it might be the Lord. But you're going to have to serve somebody. <laughs> How many of you want to serve the Lord? Amen. Amen. You can't serve both God and money. Mark 8, verse 36. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul in the end? And then Matthew 6, verse 13. Do not worry what you will eat or drink or wear, for the pagans seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Only seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all the other blessings will be added unto you. Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, also has in Colossians 3, verse 2 and 3, Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died to yourself and your life is hidden with Messiah and God. Set your mind on the things of heaven, above. And then 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Not that money is the root of all evil. Money can be used in many uh, good ways to build up the kingdom of God, but it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And Yeshua adds in Matthew 6, you can't serve both God and money while you'll wind up loving one and hating the other. Now, I purposely gave a lot of scriptural support for all of this because these are all scriptures which exhort us to seek God's kingdom first, to trust in God to provide, and to not hold back what belongs to Him, meaning the tithe which is holy to the Lord. Now let's talk about fear for a moment. Because of all the stumbling blocks which cause us to rebel against God's word, fear is at the top of the list. Meaning that you're afraid that God's not going to come through for you. So therefore you have to take matters into your own hands. And you know that Satan uses this tactic to get you to disobey God, which then will lead to rebellion, which will cut off your blessings and actually lead to severe consequences. And the Bible is full of examples of fear which led to rebellion. Remember in Exodus 32, the Israelites and the golden calf, they got tired of waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain or they were afraid that Moses disappeared. So they con Aaron, the high priest, they build a golden calf, they proclaim a feast and they worship the golden calf. And as a result of their fear and their rebellion, 3,000 of them died in one day. Furthermore, in general, the Israelites in the wilderness, they kept crying out to Moses, did you bring us out here to die? Over and over again. Why didn't you leave us in Egypt, where we had leeks and onions and garlic and cucumbers and melons, mm, getting hungry, and other provisions? They kept complaining, even though God was supernaturally already providing for them in the wilderness. Manna from heaven, the 
quail, water from the rock, their clothes and their sandals never wore out. They didn't believe in the faithfulness of God to provide for them. Why? Out of fear. And they were actually then compromising the holiness of God. And as we all know, as a result, only Joshua and Caleb made it into the promised land from that generation. How about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5? They lied to the Holy Spirit. That is blasphemous in itself. And they secretly held back money that belonged to the Lord. Why? Because they had fear. And both of them were struck down dead. They had fear of not having enough for themselves. That was at the core of their rebellion. And then there is the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, where the one who was given five talents invested in the kingdom of God and brought back five more. The same thing happened to the one who was given two talents. And Yeshua replied to both of them, well done, good and faithful servant, now I will make you a ruler over many things. And again, he who can be trusted in the little things will be trusted with the greater riches. But the parable goes on. The one who was given only one talent says to his master when he returns in verse 25, saying, I was afraid and I hid your talent in the ground. And he was thrown into outer darkness where he was weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Yeshua goes on to say in that same chapter, in verse 29, for to everyone who has, more will be given and will have abundance. Meaning again, you can't outgive God. But from him who does not have, the one who is stingy and fearful, even what he has will be taken away. Now, we all know that the world is in a lot of trouble today. The economy is still shaky. And our financial future may be unpredictable. That's if you're looking at it in the natural. But God, somebody say, but God. But God is a lot bigger than all of that. Can I get an amen? Amen. We have not been given a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. God's perfect love casts out all fear. We serve a faithful, covenant-keeping God. And He can be trusted. He's going to provide all of our needs, just like He provided for, all, for the Israelites as they were traveling through the wilderness. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. A faithful covenant-keeping God. Even to a thousand generations, we're included in that, who love Him and who obey His commandments. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says that without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that He is. How many of you believe that He exists? He's real. Amen. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How many of you are going to trust God? How many of you are going to trust God to provide for you? How many of you are going to trust God to take care of you? How many of you are going to trust God to meet all of your needs? He will. And if you believe it, give him a clap off for you right now. Don't walk in fear. Don't doubt. Because if we walk in fear, we're going to violate His Word. We're not going to trust Him. We're going to hold back what belongs to Him. And then we are indeed walking in rebellion. And you know, rebellion is a serious thing because it is compared to witchcraft in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. And it will lead to severe consequences. Let's turn to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, and we're going to begin with verse 8.
We all know this scripture. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, or test me in this, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. That's plain and simple. Not putting in your tithe is stealing from God. That's what the word says. You know, as a Messianic Jewish congregation, we like to emphasize that we honor the Sabbath. It's one of the ten declarations. We sang it earlier. We delight in your Shabbat. Hallelujah. Somebody say, thank God it's Shabbat. Thank God it's Shabbat. But what good is that if we're violating the commandment that says thou shalt not steal? Meaning from God. In the Brit Hadashah, the book of James, chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, says if we break even one of the commandments, it's like breaking all of them. So if you're going to call the Sabbath holy, you've got to call the tithe holy as well. If you're going to honor the Sabbath, you've got to honor the tithe as well. Isn't it better to trust the Lord, put in the tithe, let him open up the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you won't even be able to contain it? Can you imagine that? Imagine that God is pouring out so many blessings upon you that you can't even contain it to the point where you say, stop already. I'm too blessed. Give it to someone else. And in reality, no, you give it to someone else. Freely you have received, freely you give. Now, let's read the next verse, verse 11, and this is in connection with verse 10. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. So Hashem is saying here, if you put in your whole tithe, I will rebuke the devourer. I will rebuke Satan for your sake, that he will not be able to steal from you, that he will not be able to attack your finances, that he will not be able to rob you of your prosperity, that he will not be able to steal my blessings from you, says the Lord, meaning that God is going to disarm him. And the Lord is saying, I will do this because you have brought the tithe into my storehouse. However, it does stand to reason that the opposite is true. If you do not put in the tithe, if you do not obey me, says the Lord, then I cannot be your covering and you are open game for the enemy. And also, you have no one to blame but yourself because I, the Lord, have warned you. Now, I've known a lot of believers in 36 years in ministry. A lot of believers who thought they were getting away with something by not putting in their tithe. Thinking, well, maybe God won't see. And for a season, there were no obvious consequences. But sooner or later, their sin found them out. And God says in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, sooner or later, your sin will find you out and you can be sure of it, that that's going to happen. And I have discovered that sooner or later, God somehow will extract from you what you have stolen from him. Uh, Pastor Gene gave an excellent teaching last night. He used this scripture. Yeshua says in Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27, a wise man builds his house upon the rock, meaning obedience to God's word. And when the wind and the rain and the storms come, that house will stand. 
But a foolish man builds his house upon the sand, meaning disobedience to God's word. And when the storms come, that house will fall, and great will be its fall. Now, there's no doubt that for some of us, that putting in our tithe can sometimes be difficult, especially during hard times. But Psalm 126, verse 5, is a great encouragement to us. It says, those who sow in tears shall reap with joy. But he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That does not mean we're going to start singing, bringing in the sheaves here at the tabernacle. But I think you get the point of that scripture. Paul adds in Galatians 6 verse 9, he says, Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you faint not. So don't let go through, going through hard times be a justification for violating the word of God. Because if we obey his word, God will cause us to reap with joy in the end. Now I realize some of you may be thinking that I'm hitting this subject pretty hard, and I am. Because again, I want to see all of you get God's richest blessing in your life. This is an important topic. But let me also add, having said all of that, a great praise report. How many of you want to hear a good praise report? The last time I gave this message, I said I usually like to give it about once a year because we have many new people that come and they need to know our position on tithes and offerings. The last time I gave this message was in the beginning of January 2013. It was almost a year and a half ago. And here's the praise report. Since that time, general tithes and offerings have increased here at the Tabernacle by 20%. In the year 2013 alone, our tithes, general tithes and offerings were up by about $36,000. And you're to be commended. I want to commend the congregation for being obedient to the word of God. Let's, let's keep it up. But also as your rabbi, let me give you the friendly reminder. First to all of you who are Members, formally speaking, please remember when you filled out your application, you promised to tithe. You made a vow. And let your yes be yes and your no be no because anything else comes from the evil one. You know, we're all in a covenant relationship together. We're all a family. Somebody say, We're all a family. All a family. Say it again, we're all a family. And we operate like a family, the family of God. And we also have promised to help you during hard times. We take a full 10% of the general tithes and offerings and we put it into a special needy fund. And over the last 10 years, we have given approximately $138,000 to help families in need. That's not bad for a relatively small congregation. Because that's God's heart, that's my heart, is operating like a family when someone needs help during hard times. We're going to help them. So we're doing our part and you need to do your part because if we all obey God's word, everything runs smoothly. This is how we operate as a mishpacha, as a family. God's word really works. Let's do it God's way. Now let me add some other instruction here. For those of you who are in volunteer ministry, meaning singers and dancers and flaggers and other areas of worship, banner wavers, those who operate PowerPoint, sound men, Bible teachers, Shabbat school teachers, Beit Midrash teachers, those who are on 
Torah ministry, you know, those who handle the Torah each week as we march it around the congregation, take it out of the ark, put it back in the ark. You know, we have 22 men on our Torah team in all that handle the Torah. But think about it this way. If you're carrying and you're lifting up the Torah of God, you've got to obey it. Kitchen ministry, nursery, armor bearers, men's ministry, women's ministry, or how long? Watchmen on the wall. Meaning everybody. Malachi 3.10, God says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. And I want you to know that we greatly appreciate your sacrifice, your time, and your effort. But it's not a trade-off for your tithe, or even for a portion of your tithe. And also, neither is giving to the building fund, although we are encouraging that. And earlier we did see in Haggai 1.8, God says, build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. But the tithe comes first. Everything else is an offering to the Lord. And that includes for me, pastors, elders, others in leadership, the whole congregation. I know I'm being redundant, but if we obey the Lord, everything runs smoothly and there's plenty of food in the storehouse. Let's look at one last scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter 9, let's begin with verse 5. Paul writes, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time, underline that, and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity, not as a grudging obligation. Again, it's not that we have to give, but hallelujah, we get to give. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So Paul exhorts believers to honor the promises that they made and to even pre to prepare their gift beforehand. This is important. To prepare their gift beforehand. Not maybe at the last minute. Not some wishy-washy giving. Not tipping God. Not throwing God a bone. That's all a slap in his face, I believe. but prayerfully preparing it because it's holy to the Lord. And Paul connects it with the spirit of generosity, not as a grudging obligation to give cheerfully. And again, not I have to, but hallelujah, I get to. You know, I, I do believe it's a good thing that we sound the shofar and give a shout offering to the Lord whenever we bring tithes and offerings to him. So in reality, let's be led by the Spirit, not by the flesh, because all of this is anointed giving. Remember that God can do more for you with 90% than you can do for yourself with 100%. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. It's the same thing as just like he can do more for you in six days than you can do for yourself self in seven days. Now some further instruction, just in case some of you have questions. 
I mean, I'm laying it all right out there today. What exactly do I tithe off of? A tithe is a full 10% of your paycheck. Right at first, it's your first fruits, it's your bickering offering to the Lord. If you make $100 a week, your tithe is $10. If you make $1,000 a week, your tithe is $100. If you make $10,000 a week, your tithe is $1,000. If you make $100,000 a week, then you can help us to build our new sanctuary. <laughs> now, it doesn't stop there. Because a tithe is also a full 10% of other earnings, meaning a house that's sold, an inheritance that you have received, an investment that paid off, royalties. And I can relate to that because I do receive songwriter royalties from songs I've written 45 years ago, even to a little more present. I'm still getting a lot of royalties. And I immediately tithe off of that. You know, I have to tell you something that it scares me not to tithe. It makes me very uncomfortable. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Or an income tax refund. You know, Yeshua said, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Any other unexpected financial blessing, tithe off of it, but I always say this, not alone. If you borrow money, just pay it back. Here's another question. What if I attend another congregation on a regular basis? Well, if you're a visitor here, your tithe belongs to your home congregation. However, any free will offerings above the tithe, we would greatly appreciate. How about this? I've been asked this question. What if my spouse is already tithing off of his or her paycheck? Do I still have to tithe off of mine? <laughs> what do you think? What if I attend this congregation regularly as well as another one? Well, then I would say, tithe to both. You'll still be three and a third percent ahead of the Israelites. <laughs> really, that's a tough one, yet it's common in Messianic Judaism because we do have a lot of people who attend a regular church on Sunday and who come to the tabernacle regularly on Shabbat. You'll just have to be led by the Spirit you can never go wrong if you follow the anointing, the anointing of God. What if I miss services? I, what if I get sick or I um, go on vacation or some emergency comes up? Do I still need to mail in or make up my tithe the next time that I come? Well, of course you do. Anointed giving means being consistent and honoring your commitment to the Lord. And I do want to commend those who faithfully mail in their tithe or send it in with a friend when they can't make services. That has happened. How about this one? What if the rabbi is out of town? <laughs> Let me tell you something. No matter where I am, the rabbi is always in town. And he is watching all the time. Mark 12, verse 41 says, Yeshua was watching as the people put money into the temple treasury. And so in conclusion, really, it's not my intention to offend anyone. The teaching today is really about holiness. Just like Shabbat is holy. Just like all the festivals are holy, which God calls holy convocations, 
Just like kashrut, the dietary laws are about holiness. The teaching is to remind you of the word, what the Word of God says so that you can get God's greatest blessing in your life. Let me also add this. This message is for people of all ages. Parents, teach your children to tithe. I like what Pastor Clint said earlier. Bring them up with you. Let them drop the tithe into the offering basket. Let them develop it as a lifestyle now. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way that they should go, and in the end they will not depart from it. You know, often when we are worshiping the Lord, I ask the parents to come forward, bring your children with you, teach them how to worship God in the splendor of His holiness, Teach them also how to worship God with the tithe which is holy to the Lord. God's word really works. Let's do it God's way, not man's way. The Lord even says, test me in this. Test me and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven for you. This is the same God who said, consider your ways several times in Haggai chapter 1. He can almost hear that his heart is crying out to us to obey him so that he can bless us. Let's not compromise God's word. That's not the answer. His word is the only real truth that we have. Heaven and earth may pass away, but God's word endures forever. Now let's take a few moments of silence and just let the Lord speak to you in the quiet place and then we'll sing one last song. Before we sing, I want to remind everyone that there is a pushka in the back. That pushka is not just for you to put in a makeup tie or anything similar to that. It is for that reason, but not just for that reason. If you are going through a financial crisis, if you have a financial need, I'd like you to write it down and put it in that pushka. I want to know about it. God wants to know about it. Remember, we're all a family. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and who are called according to His purpose.
Tend unto my prayer, I want to obey. Whatever I say, whatever I do, I want to be a vessel for you. Speak to me, O oh Lord, your servant is listening. Hearken unto my cry. Teach me your ways. Speak to me, O oh Lord, your servant is listening. Attend unto my prayer, I want to obey. Now let's all stand. You need prayer this morning. Please come down to the front. We'll pray for you. Hallelujah. Speak to me. Speak to me, O oh Lord. Your servant is listening.
Your servant is listening. Hearken unto my cry and teach me your ways. Speak to me, O oh Lord. Your servant is listening. Attend unto my prayer, I want to obey. And Chava, could you and Marta come and pray for Daryl and Jerry? Ivarecha Adonai Vaishmarecha Yair Adonai Panavalecha Likulecha Isa Adonai Panavalecha 
Hashem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Perfect peace, Beshem Yeshua HaMashiach, the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, that thy way may be known upon the earth and thy salvation amongst all of the nations. Hallelujah. If you love the Lord, let's give him one more great big clap off for your praise of the Lord. God bless you. Shabbat Shalom. We're dismissed. Let's go downstairs for some food and fellowship. And again, Shabbat Shalom.